So I have a message that, again, it, it, I, I know it sounds maybe um, hype, like hype, but truly it feels like every week uh, what I'm sensing and hearing from the Lord maybe seems to be the most important message of my life and uh, the most important subject in your word. And so uh, today I want to talk about the, the danger of ungodly judgment and uh, the, the disaster that it sets in motion when we judge other people wrongly, how it affects them. But today especially I want to focus on how when we judge other people the wrong way, how it really affects us, the door that it opens to uh, making us small and weak and vulnerable in many areas of our lives. And so um, our beginning verse is actually Matthew 7, 1 through 3. And uh, it's been quoted quite a bit and I think even misunderstood quite a bit. Matthew 7, 1 says, Do not judge that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye and do not notice the log that is in your own? I, I think this is very intentionally offensive language. We worry about the problem that somebody else has or is causing, and then we focus our attention on them in a way that devalues, that demeans, that judges them. Um, and by the way, it's very important, I think, to point out at this point, we all judge many situations all the time, and you can't help but have to discern to test what is good and what is wrong, what is evil, and what is of God, what isn't of God. So in most cases in the Bible, when you look up that word judge, the majority of the verses talk about uh, judgment in terms of it being uh, judging rightly. So whenever somebody feels even um, conviction, when somebody feels like you're criticizing them, how often have you heard people misinterpret this verse and go, oh, judge not lest you be judged. And there's a principle there that's true, but what this is talking about, I'm not explaining this very well. <clears throat> the majority of the verses I read, judgment is considered a good thing. You're able to discern, you're able to judge good from bad, right from wrong. You're able to judge rightly. And so what does the Bible consider judging rightly versus judging wrongly? And what is the destructive pattern that you set in motion when you judge in a way that Jesus never judged? When you judge in a way that your father doesn't want you uh, valuing other people through a lens of criticism or through a lens even of condemnation. And so uh, it's a very important distinction because we are going to someday be judging angels. We are going to be making assessments in our own lives and continually growing and learning. But when we begin to step in judgment toward another person and their value as a human being, and we draw a conclusion, they're never going to change, they're worth less now, that I don't want anything left uh, anything to do with them. I want to commit psychological murder. I'm going to separate my life from them because of this behavior in their life. That's the kind of judgment where now you're bringing in condemnation. You're operating as the judge. Only God is able to bring final and complete judgment in terms of discipline and correction. What's very interesting, in my view, and we're going to look at it a little deeper, the Bible doesn't primarily encourage us to judge situations with an eye toward punishment. It encourages us to judge situations in a way that will bring that other person into greater maturity, greater wholeness, greater safety, able to relate to God and to other people more completely. There are patterns in our life that are wrong, that break relationship. And biblically, we're supposed to judge situations that help people move forward into greater relationship. 
And so I want to share something personal. I don't know. This could be the primary part of the message. I've been sitting with this now, I think, for about six weeks and really asking when is the right time to share this. But my personal awareness and conviction of the danger and the power of judgment, ungodly judgment, critical judgment of another person, became exposed and tested about six weeks ago. And so uh, Lori and I were spending a morning together, and she began to share some personal pain, some areas of even self-hatred that, in my experience with her, I don't think I've ever heard her share out of that depth of pain, of um, self-loathing even. And it scared me. It really, it got, I tried to be present, and I listened, and I tried to help her process, and it's like, oh, wow, this is serious deal and it so much got my attention that uh, I was having to go somewhere after we had processed that stuff and while I was driving in a way that was unusual for me I began to pray and I was praying for her I was just praying uh, protection for her I was coming against lies I was praying for a breakthrough I mean I was interceding with a passion and a depth that for me it was unusual and then my prayer turned and I said, Lord, anything that I have done, anything that I have done that has contributed to her feeling this way, this, this overwhelming sense of uh, hopelessness and of self-hatred, you know, I, I repent of it. I apologize. I don't want to do it. Uh, you know, I ask you, show me, Lord. I just, I, I, I don't want to have anything to do with what is causing this in her life. In Jesus' name, amen. And I probably prayed for 15 or 20 minutes along that line. And uh, in a way that's unusual in my experience, the very next day I woke up, and from the first thing in the morning, I began to become aware of body language, facial expressions, tone of voice, attitudes that I was showing toward Lori that was showing frustration, showing disrespect, showing irritability, impatience. I couldn't believe it. All of a sudden, it's like the blinders had been taken off and the Lord was showing me. And I don't want to set a percentage, but I can guarantee you that the larger percentage, the majority of what was causing that issue in her was my attitude that had crept in over a period of time that I was totally unaware of, that my desire to be a good husband, my desire to build my wife up and let her grow into everything that she has, is such a deep conviction, and I began to operate contrary to many of the core values that I even have. I was becoming, not unknowingly, a grumpy old man more focusing on my frustrations or dissatisfactions than on my appreciation. And ironically, this is how I had judged Lori, uh, we're very different people, and God has used it in a tremendous way in both of our lives to mature and to season us. Uh, but, you know, I tend to be uh, more optimistic. Lori can see what the problems are going to be soon, and, you know, right away we... Uh, during the fires here in Oregon, uh, our daughter Alyssa asked if we were doing okay, and uh, Lori posted, smoke bad. And I saw it, and it kind of cracked me up, and, and then I knew right away, my next response was, life good, because I was having some wonderful experiences in my life. Then our daughter said, well, that pretty much summarizes the dynamic between my parents. Smoke bad, life good. And out of that foundation, I shared with Lori something I learned in my marriage training uh, from Dr. John Gottman. And I said, you know, I think it would really help us if you could begin to be intentional about trying to operate according to the magic ratio. The magic ratio is five positives and one negative. So we have to state our concerns, our, our frustrations, uh, when we feel someone isn't treating us appropriately. You, you can't just bury that stuff. You'll go crazy. But if all you do, if you give five negatives, five confrontations and only one positive, over time, people are going to want to avoid you. It's like, well, here comes bad news. It's normally it's not, not, you know, not a good interaction. And so it's like, hey, can we work on this? And I was adopting it as my own personal conviction too. 
And over the years, that became like a voice inside of me. Hey, could we just do the magic ratio? Could you just do the magic ratio? I was judging Lori and the way God had even designed her to be able to see and fix problems in a way that I don't have that capacity. <clears throat> and as I was judging that, ironically, I believe spiritually, I began to move into a place where in my behavior, my attitude, my tone of voice, I was giving her five negatives and only one positive. And she was gradually being destroyed because of me violating <clears throat> that thing I had judged in her. I had become vulnerable to the thing I had judged in another person. And I believe that is the real danger of judgment. Um, the things that irritate us in other people are often the very things that we either are struggling with in ourselves, or even more than that, the things that irritate us about other people that we begin to judge concerning them, we now have given the enemy opportunity to come and oppress us in that area because we're judging somebody else. Now the enemy can come and we become vulnerable to the very thing. And how many times have people said, I never could have imagined I would have done such a thing. <clears throat> and then they found themselves doing something, being vulnerable to an area of self-destructive behavior that they had um, judged in others. So it's a very powerful thing. Uh, I will say, as I was processing this with the Lord and repenting of it, and wasn't it wonderful, the empowerment? I mean, this sounds odd, but the empowerment, the grace God gave me to see so quickly my own behavior and to really own it and to not just try to, through willpower change, but through my conviction of what I really did want. And it was in, in my life, uh, I, apparently I watch more movies than I read the Bible because I had two movies that came into my mind when I was processing all of this. Uh, and one of them was the movie Parenthood with Steve Martin. And in the movie, they have this family gathering and they're sitting at the family table. And his father, Jason Robards, is sitting at the table and he, in front of the family, is making these critical, negative, cynical comments about his wife. And his wife just looks kind of beat down and quiet and he's kind of being disrespectful in front of everybody and i inside i just got frustrated it's like i never want to be that man i don't ever want to treat a family member that disrespectfully in private or in public and and so that was like almost a vow for me <laughs> and then there's another movie uh grand canyon with uh kevin klein and in the movie he's having an affair with his secretary and he decides to break off the affair and remain with his wife. And so he's telling his secretary, and she makes this statement where she's angry, she's rejected, she's hurting, and she finally goes, you know, there's a man out there who's going to treat me like I'm exactly the thing he wants. I love that. And, and inside, when I even saw that, it was like, oh, I want to treat Lori like she's exactly the thing that I want. So by the way, negative vows, I don't want to be the father in parenthood. That doesn't work so well. You'll tend to get attracted again because you're judging even that fictional character. But if you think of a positive vow, wait a minute, I want to be the kind of guy where my wife knows I appreciate her. I am believing God is the one that brought us together. I am grateful for all of the good things that we've done for each other and in each other's lives and God has done through each other. And I want to express that. And I want to begin to speak to that in a five to one ratio where I can take personal responsibility rather than expecting her to do it. I need to continue to operate according to that conviction. So, um, what it reminded me of is, I think, John Arnott's greatest teaching is basically on forgiveness, but he calls it grace-level living. And uh, I wish I could illustrate it a little better. I'm limited a little bit because of the camera. But basically, grace-level living means that you want to be forgiven. You want there to be empowerment and grace extended to you to help you move through areas of weakness, areas of sin, areas of self-destructive behavior. You want to be empowered to mature 
And it can only come as a gift outside of yourself. And all you have to do is, okay, Lord, I am saved by grace through faith. I trust you're going to forgive me. You have my best interest at heart. And so please forgive me. Help me move forward. And God loves when people walk up into that level of receiving grace from him and, and getting past the shame, the condemnation, the attraction to sin even in your life. He, 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 that's the environment where we all continue to flourish and to grow and be who we're created to be. And it's uh, what Miko calls that field of liberty. Once you come into that place of salvation, you have all this freedom to explore your options of what God's going to empower your life to be. And uh, we all want to live there. But then the problem is, somebody will frustrate us. Somebody will offend us. Somebody will do something that's absolutely wrong. And then we step down from that level of receiving grace. And the only requirement of continually receiving God's grace is that we extend that grace to other people. And so as long as we're extending that desire for their breakthrough, that desire for their maturity, that desire for their healing. We're releasing the forgiveness that they need to get set free from the past. As we're operating in that, we're receiving that. But then somebody will do something, and heaven help us all, we don't know our areas of vulnerability. What is the area that you're going to be offended at that you will begin to react without even thinking about it? But all of a sudden you go, God, what they did is wrong, and I want justice. I want them to be exposed. They shouldn't be able to hurt anybody else. I shouldn't have been treated like that. All of a sudden, we start crying out in our judgment before the Father and bringing accusations against another person created in the image. And as we step down from that grace level living, we're now living in a justice level. Well, I want things to be fair. I want things to be just. And the problem is when we're living on that level, now the enemy has authority to come in and to even oppress us, torment us, give us nagging thoughts that maybe we'll find a place to land that we'll begin to act upon. We respond to that lie. And the next thing you know, now we're not extending the grace. And what does that do for our ability to receive the grace that we need? And the beauty of this, by the way, is the minute you come to your senses, whoa, hold on. I'm treating somebody, Lord, in a way that you don't treat me. I'm treating somebody in a way I wouldn't want someone else to treat me like. Father, I repent. Just like with Lori. Anything I've done that's contributed to this, I, I don't want it. I repent of it. Show it to me. By the way, he will show it to you. <laughs> so prepare yourself. But the minute you turn your, your heart back to the Lord and you say, okay, I don't want to live on the justice level because I don't want to get what I deserve. They, they don't need to get what they deserve the way we understand it, in a human judgment way, in a punishment sort of way, the minute you repent of that, whoop, you come right back up into that grace level of living where it's like, oh, it's so good to be forgiven. It's so good to have love flowing out of my actions instead of cold love that has been corrupted by offense. Oh, uh, John Arnott does a much better teaching about grace level living but it embedded into my spirit. And yet, you can drift away from those deep, simple convictions that you have sometimes, get caught off guard. And the, uh, the beautiful formula is just repent soon. I think maturity isn't about being perfect and never making mistakes. Maturity is about repenting as quickly as you possibly can and getting back up into that place of grace-level living. Yeah. And so, I... Uh, I want to move toward a, even a conclusion in this with a, a passage that I had fresh revelation on. It's probably been a couple of years ago now. And, uh, but it speaks to the heart of this so beautifully. John 3.16 through 18. It says, For God so loved the world, mo probably the most memorized verse in the Bible, that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. But 17, people always quote that part, but then they don't seem to quote 17. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world. 
He didn't send him into the world to condemn, to punish, to bring justice on a, in a human sense, a justice level way of living. He didn't send him to judge the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. The one who believes in him is not judged. The one who does not believe in him has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And that's the New American Standard Bible, by the way. So here's, here's where this leads for me. Most of us are raised in an idea of what justice is. And it's human justice. And it's punishment based. You do the crime, you do the time, you're going to be segregated from people so you can't keep hurting people more. You know, there, there's, it seems like there's a measure of fairness, but it doesn't change the human heart. In fact, it can harden the human heart. And this is too deep to really unpack entirely, but our justice system in many, many cases is far from just. And it views the judge as the one who dispenses punishment. And I believe the Hebraic, the, the biblical view of justice is very different than what we understand. The biblical view of justice is not the death or the destruction of the lawbreaker. It is, I believe, contained the best in the story of Solomon and the two women who were fighting over a baby. A woman's baby died, so she wanted to take another woman's baby, you know, and raise it as her own. And they were brought before Solomon, and he had to judge, well, which, you know, whose baby is this? And many of you know this story, Solomon dispensing ju uh, justice, having the greatest wisdom that was ever given to any man before or after. He said, okay, what we're going to do then, because we don't know whose baby this really is, we're going to just cut the baby in half and give each of you half. And uh, the one woman was satisfied with that answer, and the other one was like, no, no, let the baby live. And then Solomon said, okay, only the mother would be able to say that. So he restored the baby back to the right relationship with the mother. You know, nowhere in the story does it say, then the other woman who was sinning was carted off to jail, she was beaten, and she was punished, and, you know, what a horrible thing she did. The point was justice, and, and even justice for that mother was for her to see what she was doing and how wrong it was, how it would break relationship with you know, the mother. And so when God disciplines, when he corrects us, when he ch chastises us, Here's the heart of it. It's not out of frustration. It's not out of human judgment. It's not out of a place of, you know, you need to get exposed and punished so you can get better. His heart is always, I'm going to create a situation where you can now begin to do things and act according to what's going to work in relationship with me and relationship with others. It's a different redemptive heart and attitude entirely. I think what keeps most people who don't have a real relationship with the Lord away is the fear that he's going to be a cruel, mean, severe judge who is going to condemn them because they know they deserve condemnation. And yet the heart of our Father is entirely different than that. I, I wish, again, I could do an even better job of this, but as I've come to know his characters, I've come to know his nature what he expects of me hasn't decreased, it's actually increased. But I know now it's increased for my welfare, for my best interest, for my benefit, because the more I become like him, the more of a blessing I'm going to be to others. And the more faith I can walk in, the more relationship I'm going to walk in with him, and that relationship I have with him is going to free me up and... And then to know all of these things over all of these years, to believe this so deeply, and then in the most important relationship uh, in my life, my most important human relationship, to begin to operate in a contrary way because of getting older, getting tired, getting frustrated. I don't even know how it all happened, but thank God 
for the conviction. Because as I thought about it the next day or two after I was really letting the Lord muck around in my soul and expose things, and, and I began to think, how in the world do I think I can have a life that's going to be blessed and be a blessing to others if I'm violating the most important relationship in, in, in my life? How, what, what are the other consequences? How do I ultimately feel about myself if I am actually treating Lori with disrespect? Do, I, hope you can, I hope you can hear this, and guys especially. I just want to challenge you. Your wife, your girlfriend, your daughters either think that you believe that they are exactly the thing that you want, that you are grateful for them, or they think they have to earn your approval. They have to perform to have value. And women will perform themselves to death to try to get the acceptance that they are already due. And so I just challenge you, go to the Lord, ask him, are there ways, wives, husbands, boyfriends, girlfriends, family members, are there ways that you're treating people where you're bringing human judgment in a way that's actually sowing areas of death or destruction into lives of people that you love? Are you willing to look at the log in your own eye before you worry about the speck that is in somebody else's? And isn't it amazing? God uses that offensive language because if you come with that heart, I'm willing for you to show me my part in this because that's all that you have authority over and ultimate responsibility for is the part that you play in it but if you're willing to even face that formula, okay, show me my log, he'll do it. And it's not to shame you. It's to free you. It's to heal you. It's to mature you. Because his heart is only committed to your welfare and your best interest. Hmm. So surprise, I'm not the perfect Charlie. God is still revealing areas of my life that I need to uh, get healed and repent of. But I'm at a season in my life where there's no stigma in that. I don't even mind sharing it. I hope Lori didn't mind me sharing it. I, I wanted to share it in a way that was honoring to her as well. But that's life. Learning to repent as quickly as you can. Get back up into that grace level of living where you're receiving the grace you need to empower you to extend the grace that others need, that we can all be people who bring life. And, and the very fact that Jesus didn't come to judge in a condemnation sense, we know there's no condemnation in him, but he did rightly judge the heart condition of each person he interacted with, and he spoke in a way not to punish, but to redeem those that he interacted with. So this is much, much deeper, of course. You get to explore this on your own for your own convictions. But I want to break the power of judgment over my life and the poison that as I'm being judgmental, I'm acting as the judge. You have no value. You're never going to change. You're, you are condemned now. I don't even know if you could be saved. When I begin to operate out of that, I am destroying another person. I'm adding to the struggles they have. But even more, I'm putting poison in myself. And I want the Lord, uh, by his spirit, to convict me even more quickly when I see that operating in any relationship, let alone the most important human relationship that I have. So, Father, today, I know that we all have struggled at times with getting frustrated with other people, with valuing people based on what they can or they can't do, and people that treat us with respect. It's so easy to treat them with respect. That's so human. But Lord, for us to come to that place where especially you can identify when are we judging somebody, not with godly judgment or rightly judging, but with human judgment that will open a door to poison us with the very thing we judge in others. Help us have that conviction to turn away from that. Jesus, you didn't even come to the world to judge that way. You came to save. And our lives are here 
to be a source of life and living water and a blessing. And Lord, as we continue to so desperately need your grace in our life to operate out of that grace level living, Lord, help us not lose our minds and think that we can live in that place and live on a justice level with others. Help us step out of that quickly and just learn to extend the very life-giving grace that you have given us. Let us extend it to each other. Break through those strongholds. I just come against th areas of blindness that I have, that everyone listening has, where you don't know that you've been judging. You, you, you drifted into it accidentally, gradually. But Lord, uh, bring clarity, bring conviction quickly that we can get set free, that the air is going to be fresh and clear between all of us in the way that we treat each other. I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.